So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and welcome to the last panel of the day. It has been a rather, a rather intense day, and I'm very happy uh, that the panels have been so um, so lively and so interesting. And uh, you know, we have had the privilege to have a wide representation of interests and views, as you have noticed for sure. And this last panel is particularly important in my view. Uh, and I, I, I thought when I when we devised uh, the program that a particular attention should have been given to how the creators, the individual uh, artists, the people that actually make uh, uh, creations happen, uh, how they are, how, and whether and how they are remunerated. The, the, one question is whether they get remunerated. There is the issue of online piracy. There is the issue of uh, giving content away for free in a in a. Um, smart uh, sometimes, you know, we are all aware of Creative Commons, the idea of solidarity behind dissemination of content online, but we know also that uh, authors and artists are struggling in order to have a fair remuneration, uh, uh, fr especially from the digital exploitations of their creations. So I am pleased to be here with uh, uh, extremely knowledgeable uh, um, people, experts, uh, both <laughs> academics uh, and uh, creators and ma managers of the rights of creators. And I'm happy to be uh, to have Alan Barkfried uh, uh, connected via Skype. By Alan Barkfried uh, in a is an associate, associate professor at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And uh, the idea of inviting him is linked not only to his uh, knowledge uh, as an expert, as a professor, as a consultant, but also to the fact that recently the uh, Berkeley College of Music, that is a very well-known institution um, and one of the best uh, music schools in uh, in the world, I would say, in many many uh, areas, many fields, uh, uh, jazz, pop, uh, and, and, and so forth, um, they recently published a study towards a fair and transparent digital content marketplace that I found particularly important because. It was probably the first time that a study collected data about the level of remuneration in the music industry with particular regard to the uh, download and streaming services, if I'm not mistaken. But I will leave the floor to Alan bef uh, before uh, letting our uh, um, speakers here in Dublin uh, uh, start their presentations. Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as, as Giuseppe has mentioned, um, we conducted a study about fair remuneration, and I think that's what this, this panel is about. And so um, I'm going to give you a few minute background on, on our study and the results and how we conducted it. Um, really, it's a survey of kind of the overview of the market. It's less related to copyright specifics and more related to what's happening in the actual digital marketplace for music. Um, if we can go to the first slide methodology, you can see that this was a one-year study by our faculty and students um, to look at the payments, transparency, and, and data standards that exist for uh, music. And to do this, we reviewed various recording and publishing royalty statements. We talked to over 65 different industry professionals, former and current music publishing, performance rights organization, record label, <coughs> Um, and, and many types of other um, officials, folks from digital service providers. And we had two key questions we were trying to answer. One was, are the compensation structures fair? And then also, how can technology try to solve some of the licensing and payment difficulties that exist um, in this new environment? So moving to the next slide, um, today's music industry, it's a very different business model than what existed 15 or 20 years ago. Um, it's a $15 billion global recorded music market that's down more than 50% from, um, from the peak in 2000. Um, and, and we're undergoing this tremendous shift from a pay up front to a pay as you go access model. Um, there's been a number of mainstream media stories talking about low payouts. And one of the reasons we undertook the study was we were really trying to um, get a better idea of what's happening. So, you know, artists are saying that they're receiving very small uh, payouts from folks like Deezer and Spotify and RDO and other digital services, YouTube and other digital services. And so we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into 
a, a storyline that mainstream media, I think, tends to sensationalize a little bit. Um, so, you know, I, I think one of the first thing, key things to remember as we look at this is that we are in a dramatic shift from a pay up front model to a pay as you go model. So, artists and record labels and rights owners have become very accustomed to receiving an upfront payment for an album. Uh, that may be listened to once or it may be listened to 10,000 times. And now that money is going to come in over time. And it's, a, it's more of a long tail payout. Um, estimates on streaming services, um, up to 191 million paying subscribers uh, in 2018. That's just a couple of years away. $46 billion in cumulative revenue paid out. Um, these services have, have really taken hold in places like Scandinavia, where I, I believe Spotify and streaming accounts for nearly 90% of the recorded music industry's revenue. Um, and, and looking at the payment structure, generally they pay out about 70% of their revenue to rights holders and they keep about 30% for operating costs. Uh, YouTube is slightly different. They pay about 50% instead of 70%. Um, and I believe their argument is that they have um, costs associated with procuring the advertising. Um, we, didn't, we were unable to look deeply into that particular issue. Um, as far as the split between um, recording rights and musical composition rights, musical works owners generally receive about 10% of the subscription fee. So if it's a, a 10 euro a month subscription, the musical works owners are getting about a, a euro total of that. Um, and an s and study in France uh, a couple of years ago found that labels keep about 75% of all monies paid to rights holders by services. Um, just looking in general at, at how much they pay out versus what they pay to their royalty, pay out via royalties to their artists. We can go to the next slide. Um, you know, obviously, and there's a lot of people involved in the recorded music industry. One thing we were looking at was the middlemen, typically uh, artists or writers, when they say they received a check for their plays on Spotify, they did not receive that check directly from Spotify. Spotify does not pay artists directly, they pay some third party. So it's important to remember when you hear a, a story about this, that there are intermediaries in the middle. Um, record labels, publishers, managers, performing rights organizations. And there's been a, a lack of transparency, I think, in this particular situation. Um, you have labels and some publishers that have equity ownership pieces and digital services that were part of their licensing arrangement, that they were granted as part of their licensing arrangement. Um, Vivendi made $404 million on Apple's acquisition of Beats a couple of years ago, although some of that, I believe, was equity that it was unrelated to licensing. Um, commercial contracts are having non-disclosure clauses, which also make it difficult for aud artists to audit. Um, the leak of the Sony Spotify contract in the US came out last May. That showed um, what is now referred to as breakage, um, which is this amount of the advance that, that's not actually earned out and there, was, there were questions about whether that was being shared with artists or not. Um, Warner Music Group said they'd been sharing it since 2009. Sony and Universal made an announcement when that contract came out that they would share it. Um, and then there's also been um, issues with um, signing contracts that include administrative or services fees, which are non-attributable. So they might do a, a lower um, royalty rate in exchange for some type of services payment. That services payment typically isn't accounted for um, when royalties are paid out to artists or writers. Uh, the next slide, please. You know, our study focused on really two main issues. One was revenue transparency, which I just alluded to a little bit. And then the other one was rights transparency. So. Um, you know, we're, we're all here to talk about copyright today. We, I think most people in the room know that copyright registration is not a prerequisite to having your rights. It's something that came under burn. Uh, but that's created a, a situation where it's very difficult to license and pay for content. It's not just music that has this difficulty. I believe the photography world and the book world are struggling with this as well. Um, 
but uh, you know, it makes it difficult to actually locate rights holders, make sure that you have the licenses, and, and pay those people properly. And so, um, one of the one of the issues in the music industry is when that that money is collected and they can't attribute it to a, a particular rights holder, it's put into the so-called black box. And the black box is typically paid out at the end of the year to rights holders based on market share. So um, that means that the, the larger companies are collecting a significant portion of that money. Typically, I would argue that, that those are the companies that are doing a good job of collection. So it's the, it's the smaller folks that aren't collecting their money and it's getting put into a pool that's then paid out on market share. But there's also a, a lack of standardized reporting. You have an ISRC code and an ISWC. Um, many of you may not know what that is, but the ISRC is a recording is the identifier for record, uh, sound recording, and the WC is the identifier for the musical work. Um, you would think in any type of data standard system that those would be linked, because really the best identifier of a musical composition is the sound recording itself. Um, there's no link between those. There's no data standards for reporting. Digital services are all reporting in, in different standardized formats to different rights holders. Uh, and in general, it, it's made uh, the payout process really a nightmare for the digital services. And, and uh, that's, a, that's less a copyright problem and more of a, it, it's, a it's generated by the lack of registration. But it's a, a standard setting is something that's more of a, a commercial process that needs to take place. Um, we conducted a royalty audit. Our royalty audit um, looked at a universe, Grammy nominated platinum, multi platinum universal recording artist. Um, we found that this particular file that we looked at um, had 12 different files, um, more than 120 pages of PDF. It was very, very, really pretty much impossible to understand what was happening from a, a transparency and payout perspective. There were uh, instances of negative streaming. So, um, you know, negative royalty payments on a stream. We weren't really sure what a negative uh, royalty or a negative stream could be. We inquired Universal and didn't get a response. Um, YouTube was paying the lowest rates at, at one tenth of one penny. Um, Tidal's Hi Fi service was paying uh, about uh, a penny and a half per stream. Um, and I think you know our general conclusion in this was just that, that the data sets need to be standardized, the reporting needs to be standardized, we need to have a better um, grasp of what's happening within the marketplace. Um, you know, on the black box issue, the, the European Union tried to, to work on solving this problem, at least on the music publishing side, with the Global Repertoire Database initiative, which ultimately failed after, I believe, 12 million euro of expense. Um, a few years ago, but it, it, it continues to be an issue. And if you think about, at least in the music content world today, we have 30 music, 30 million songs on Spotify, and in 10 years, the expectation is that there will be 100 million songs. And so, uh, with the democratization of the internet, has come a, a great growth in the amount of content, and that mess is is just going to get exponentially bigger if we don't do something to try to solve it. Uh, moving on to recent developments, um, since we put out the study, a few things have happened. Um, the, the Minister of Culture in France last year uh, basically made a statement that said that music stakeholders needed to agree on a, on a path forward for greater transparency. If they didn't come to some understanding on their own that the French government was going to legislate, um, a, a mediator named Mark Schwartz uh, for the French government was able to get most stakeholders on board and, and signing an, a memorandum of understanding for greater transparency. So I, I think that's a, a very positive step in the right direction on the revenue transparency side. And, and Warner Music and Sony Music announced just last week, I believe on Thursday of last week, that they're going to share any equity uh, payouts that they get from streaming services with their artists. That was a big deal. Um, uh, along those lines, Spotify was also sued in the US in December for 
failing to license and properly pay for content. Um, and I think it was a 100, I think the damages asked for were $150 million, and there were, were a couple of different suits. Um, very quickly, we moving to the next slide, we looked at some of the um, US Copyright Rec Office recommendations that were made on music licensing last year. Um, there was a 245-page report, comprehensive report released by the Copyright Office in ways that, at least in the US, music licensing could be um, updated to, to the digital age. They advocated for greater parity in the treatment of musical works and sound recordings, um, a full performance right for sound recordings in the US. This is an anomaly that exists in US copyright law where um, sound recording rights holders are not paid when, when their song is publicly performed on terrestrial radio. Um, revising the consent decrees which govern the US PROs, um, creating music rights organizations, uh, updating section 115 of the uh, US copyright law, which is the compulsory mechanical licensing. And um, they also advocated, I think at the bottom, a couple of things that we really felt like were important that came out of our study. One was um, a comprehensive database of music rights ownership information with unique identifiers and, and better standards. And that the private sector should be uh, adopting greater transparency. And I think, I think both of those issues have moved forward since we released the study last summer. Um, but there's a long way to go. And I, I'm thinking that some of the other panelists may have um, some better ideas of what's happening, particularly in EU copyright law. Uh, with respect to these issues. Uh, the final slide is just uh, a list of the recommendations that we made in our report. Um, a Creator's Bill of Rights, basically an ethical standard by which um, the artists are entitled to fair remuneration for their creation. Um, a fair music transparency certification, so um, something along the lines of a fair trade coffee movement, there could be a fair trade music movement. Um, there is actually an entity that's already working on this, um, and uh, they may be pushing it forward. Um, decentralized rights ownership database. We believe that uh, <coughs> combine, trying to combine backward-facing rights ownership information is going to be very, very difficult. So, uh, you know, trying to take the same path that the EU tried to take with getting PROs to compile their databases into one database is, is only going to meet the same death wish that that particular project also found. We need to find a decentralized way to create um, some registry information or, or a, a database of copyright information related to music and really beyond that to all, all creative works. There, you know, there are folks that are working on that registration um, and ownership issue for, like I said, <laughs> photography, books, and other types of creative content. Um, Exploration of blockchain technology. Um, if I could see you, I would ask how many people in the room know what blockchain technology is. But uh, <laughs> I never, I never know. Sometimes I get two hands, and sometimes I get the entire room. Um, but blockchain technology is experience. the technology that powers Bitcoin. Um, it is a decentralized database for payments, and uh, there's a lot of banks and a lot of financial services. Uh, businesses and, and a lot of different industries that are looking at the implications of this and we just advocated that maybe that's something that should be considered as we look at, uh, at the decentralized rights ownership database. And then finally just more education for creators. So um, making sure that creators can understand yeah. um, exactly what their rights are and how they can be remunerated fairly. Thank you very much, Alan. It was uh, an incredibly useful presentation.